Hey, 42 here. Potatoes are one of the most popular crops in the world, and for good reason. They're easy to grow, they're cheap, delicious, and you can put them into a spud gun to shoot people without getting arrested. But the simple spud that's sequestered in your pantry right this moment can be a silent killer. I'll tell you why later in the video. But first, I want to ask you, when was the last time you feared for the supply of the food on your table or in your supermarket? Aside from COVID, of course, when Janice would have decapitated you in aisle three over a broccoli. Most of us don't have to fret these days. But there was a terrible time in our history when people were forced to eat rotten potatoes because it was the only food they had. Why? You'll soon find out, because this is the horrifying story of how the humble spud was responsible for one million deaths over just seven years. Surfshark VPN keeps you safe and private by covering up everything you do online. And Surfshark VPN lets you travel the world virtually by changing your virtual location. Or whilst you are physically traveling, Surfshark also lets you connect via your home country so you don't miss out on all your home comforts such as streaming video content from home that might be blocked whilst you're traveling. There are over 3,200 servers in 100 countries, so anywhere you go, you'll find a server that fits your needs. Surfshark VPN also offers a multi-hop feature, so you can put two VPN servers between you and your online destination for even more privacy and security. And I really love Surfshark's IP rotator feature, which constantly changes your device's IP address without losing your VPN connection. It's really important to stay safe online when you're out and about, and that's why I use Surfshark VPN. So I can, for example, access my online banking safely, even on public Wi-Fi, which is something I would never do without a VPN. VPNs also keep your location and download history private so you can send and receive files securely. Quite simply, Surfshark VPN is an essential tool and make sure you don't miss this exclusive holidays deal by using the code 42, you will get up to six additional mums for free. All you have to do is click the special link in the description below. Don't miss out. And a big thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. You've probably heard of the Irish potato famine of 1845, but there are still lots of questions surrounding the tragedy. What caused it? Why couldn't the Irish just eat something else? And most importantly of all, could it happen again? perhaps to you and I? Stay with me, and by the end of this video, you'll not only understand the tragic history of the potato famine, but also how today's agricultural practices could be setting us up for a modern day disaster. The potato is native to the Andes Mountains of South America, where it was first domesticated over 7,000 years ago. It was a staple of the Inca people, who ate it boiled, mashed, and stewed. When the Spanish arrived in South America in the 16th century, they quickly realized the potato was one of the most important crops in the region and brought it back to Europe with them. But the potato was initially viewed with suspicion and disdain by European society, especially the upper class who, post-Renaissance, thought of themselves as rather important and civilized folk and enjoyed nothing more than looking down on the rest of the world and their dirty foods as they casually entertained themselves with I don't know, fencing and the occasional spanking behind the rose bushes. However, as a couple of hundred years passed, some started to identify the potato's importance as a food staple, especially for the working class. A series of PR campaigns by some of Europe's most fashionable figures soon shot the spud into stardom. Specifically, Queen Marie Antoinette of France, who wore potato flowers in her hair to promote it. There was also a famed French chef, Antoine Augustin Parmentier, who was absolutely obsessed with potatoes, to the point where it got a bit weird. He held lavish dinners attended by the upper class and royalty, where every damn dish was some variation of potato, including his namesake, Parmentier Potatoes, those delicious little cubes tossed with butter and herbs. As the potato gripped the continent, it proliferated in Ireland. Some say it was Sir Walter Raleigh who first introduced it, but however it arrived on these verdant shores, they went absolutely nuts, I mean potatoes, for it. So why did the Irish and the potato become instant BFFs? Well, the conditions there are potato perfect. Ireland is full of loamy soil, a sand-silt clay mixture that's ideal for spuds. It also enjoys a temperate climate with heavy rainfall. But most of all, Ireland in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries was a poor nation. 
Under the grip of the British Empire, it was used as a breadbasket. Oats, barley, livestock and dairy were all produced under the patronage of wealthy, remote English landowners and, well you guessed it, exported to England. And so the peasantry had to make do with whatever scraps were left over. It's no wonder they turned to the potato. It has a much higher yield per acre than many other crops and was therefore the perfect choice. Even a small plot of land could sustain a family. Potatoes are packed with essential nutrients like vitamin C, B6 and potassium. The potato's ability to sustain human life with minimal effort was a game changer. For the first time in history, a single acre of land could be used to feed a family of six for an entire year. In the 19th century, the average Irishman was consuming about five kilograms of potatoes every day. I know that sounds like a gross exaggeration, but it isn't. Bear in mind that most adult males were performing huge amounts of physical labor, so they needed more sustenance. The crop accounted for 90% of most people's diets. As you might expect, this led to a population boom in Ireland, and by the time the 19th century rolled around, up to 8.5 million people lived on the Emerald Isle. This huge population was entirely dependent on the potato for sustenance, and so they grew it on a massive scale. In fact, the Irish reliance on the potato was so extreme that the country was effectively a monoculture. That's when a single crop is grown over a large area of land. And, as you'll soon see, that was a very dangerous thing to be. It's like putting your whole life savings on a single horse. It could be a winner, but it could also twat its face on the starting gate and break its nose. In the early hours of a summer day in 1845 in County Waterford, an Irish peasant noticed the leaves of his potato plants had turned a yellowish brown. So he dug them up to investigate and what he found shocked him to his core. The potatoes were black and rotten and covered in strange lesions. They emitted a foul odour. He didn't know it at the time, but the worst chapter in Ireland's history had just begun. Specifically, a potato fungus called Phytophthora infestans had arrived on a ship. We don't know from where exactly, but the disease had been reported in Belgium earlier in that year, and we think it arrived there from North America, where it had been spotted as early as 1840. We suspect it probably originated in Mexico or the Andes. After hitting Ireland, its spread was rapid. By the end of the year, most of the crops in the country had been infested. Across the rest of Europe, people grew many different varieties of potato, but almost every potato crop in Ireland was of one single variety, the Irish lumper, because of its very high yield. Trouble was, the lumper was particularly susceptible to the blight. The impact was devastating. In the first year alone, the blight wiped out about 40% of Ireland's potato crop. That was bad, but it wasn't enough to cause widespread death and starvation. The country had experienced bad potato harvests before, and it had always been able to import other crops to make up for it. But the following year, in 1846, the entire potato crop was wiped out. But nothing could have prepared this already suffering nation for what happened the following year. Often called Black 47 for reasons that will become clear, 1847 was the most catastrophic year of the Irish potato famine. By now, the nation was reeling from two years of failed harvests. Their food reserves were exhausted. Their hopes were exhausted. They were exhausted. The population density was sky high, and when the potato crops failed, there was no food to be found anywhere. People were eating grass, nettles, and seaweed just to stay alive. You may be wondering why they didn't just eat the rotten potatoes. They're still calories, after all. Well, from our plus 21st century perspective, that might seem like an option, albeit terrible, but I'm willing to bet not many of us have ever tried to eat a large quantity of rotten food. For a start, the smell and taste of rotten potatoes was reportedly so bad it would make the majority of people instantly vomit, even as they were being dug out of the ground. Also, when a potato rots, the majority of its nutritional value is lost, so eating it is pointless. Eating them made people so violently ill they would lose more calories than they'd gain. And lastly, eat enough rotten potatoes and you'll just straight up die from toxicity poisoning. Remember at the start of the video I said that potatoes can be a silent killer, even the non-blighty potatoes that are in your cupboard. Well, it's true. Have you ever noticed those green patches that develop on slightly old potatoes? That's a toxin called solanine. 
In small doses, it causes headaches and nausea. But eat enough and you'll experience hallucinations, paralysis, and in extreme cases, death. Lacking decent food across the land, mass malnutrition set him. Typhus, dysentery, and cholera claims the lives of many. That's if they didn't die from starvation first. To make matters even worse, landlords started evicting peasants from their homes because they couldn't grow potatoes to earn their keep. Countless people were turfed out into the cold, harsh soil that by now had found every possible way to destroy their souls. It's estimated that up to half a million people died during 1847 alone. So, why didn't people start growing other crops when the potatoes started to fail? After all, this was the third year without a harvest. Well, most Irish citizens only had a small plot of land, and as previously mentioned, there are few crops that can be grown so abundantly and feed a whole family like the potato can. And it would have taken months to source alternative seeds, that's if they had the resources to do so, which they didn't. Then they would have had to prepare the land and wait until the following year for those seeds to bear fruit, if they did at all. Also, most of the land in Ireland was owned by absentee English land and gentry, and they held strict rules about what the Irish could grow on their land. Those rules were basically potatoes to feed the Irish, and everything else, like grain, had to be exported. Of course, during the famine, Ireland was under the charge of Britain, the most powerful country in the world at the time. So they obviously sent help immediately to alleviate the Irish of their woes. Yeah, not quite. Britain's response to the famine was slow and ineffective, and has since been the subject of great criticism, and it's easy to see why. At the end of 1845, British Prime Minister Robert Peel ordered a bulk load of cheap corn from America to send to Ireland, often referred to as Peel's Brimstone, but it didn't arrive until the following year, and when it did, it was all hard. It required grinding to be made into food, which much of the Irish populace didn't have the tools to do. It was also less nutritious than potatoes, and all of the corn arrived into coastal towns, so it never actually reached the interior of the country where the famine was hitting the hardest. The British also set up the Public Works Programme in response to the famine, which offered employment to impoverished Irish so they could buy food. But it was all pretty bloody pointless. They were primarily tasked with building bridges and roads that led to places of little importance or were already well connected. It was all very reminiscent of Victorian workhouses, when the inmates were made to pick the fibres from old ropes, not because it needed to be done, just because. The Public Works programme also had another major flaw. Well, two actually. Firstly, the wages were extremely low, barely enough to support a family. And secondly, the work was gruelling and physically demanding, so the workers would burn off a huge amount of calories and would have to purchase even more food to survive than before. Having said all this, it's often reported that the Public Works Programme was the most effective relief effort of them all during the famine. At least those that came from the British, but even if it did do good in some places, it was abolished in 1846 when British Prime Minister Robert Peel was replaced with Lord John Russell, who unfortunately had little care for the plight of the Irish and did even less to help than Peel. The cold harsh truth was that many of the most influential people in high British society didn't want to help the Irish. At the time, Britain's official economic policy was laissez-faire, which meant they left markets to run their own course with minimal intervention, believing only the strong should prosper. It was like capitalism on crack. Also, there was a feeling among some of the more unsavoury types in Britain that the Irish were an impure race, and the famine was basically a punishment from God for their Catholic sins. Remember, Britain was predominantly Protestant at this point, particularly in the South. A British civil servant, Charles Trevelyan, who was largely in charge of the relief efforts, is infamously known for saying that the famine was an, quote-unquote, effective mechanism for reducing surplus population, and a judgement of God. Lovely guy. With the British providing as much help as a chocolate teapot to soothe the ailing nation, the Irish took it upon themselves to find a way out. During the famine, over one million Irish fled the country, making Moses and his Israelites look like bloody amateurs. The majority emigrated to America, but Irish communities were established all over the world, from Australia to Argentina. The Great Emigration had a huge impact on global demographics and is one of the reasons why so many people outside of Ireland claim Irish heritage to this day. But for many, even though they were starving to death, the decision to leave Ireland wasn't an easy one. 
At the start of the famine, passage to America cost between three to five pound, which was out of reach for most families. But as it progressed and the masses grew increasingly desperate to leave, some ship owners lowered the price to between one to two pounds, but there was a catch. They had to live in steerage for the entirety of the gruelling eight-week voyage. This was the hold of the ship, where conditions were dim, grim, crowded, and extremely unsanitary. Most would be forced to sleep sandwiched between others, like sardines, on planks of solid wood. Hence, these famine ships eventually became known as coffin ships. The mortality rates were as high as 20%, with most dying from typhus, or ship fever as many called it. Even after the famine had subsided, the emigration from Ireland continued in great numbers. Before the famine, the population of Ireland was 8.5 million. By 1960, after decades of continuous emigration, the populace had dipped all the way to 4.4 million. In fact, as of writing this video, Ireland has only just surpassed 5 million once again, which is obviously still well below its pre-famine numbers. This is in stark contrast to most other nations that have seen surging population numbers since the 19th century. The effects of the famine changed Ireland in a way that few other world events ever have for any other single nation. And it wasn't just the population that changed, everything did. For example, the famine is often blamed for wiping out the Irish language. Well, not entirely, but it certainly made a noticeable dent in its usage. How? Well, to put it rather morbidly, the famine killed most of its speakers. The west and south of Ireland were the hardest hit by the famine, and they also happened to be where the Irish language was most dominant. And the millions of others who emigrated mostly did so to English-speaking countries, where they no longer had much need for their native tongue. After the famine, there was also a stigma surrounding the Irish language. Many of the job opportunities that emerged were for English employers or English companies who demanded their Irish employees speak English, not Irish. So, foregoing the Irish language and replacing it with English was seen as a means to upwards economic and social mobility. This was unfortunately echoed through the Irish school system. After the famine, some schools would punish their pupils for speaking Irish instead of English. Although it has seen a bit of a resurgence in recent years, with Irish language lessons now being a compulsory school subject in the Republic of Ireland. However, the amount of active daily speakers remains very low. It's about 2% today. Whereas in the 1800s, it was about 40%. If there's a major lesson we can learn from history, it's that great progress is often born from great tragedy. And although the famine was devastating to Ireland, it did teach both Ireland and the rest of the world the importance of diversification in agriculture. Or more accurately, it taught us the dangers of monocultures. An entire country was fed on a single strain of a single crop. After the famine, Irish farmers started to diversify. Moving away from the doomed lumper, they planted a range of blight-resistant potatoes. Grains and other crops are also grown to supplement the new diet. But here's another lesson for you. History is often doomed to repeat itself. The global population has exploded since the 19th century. And you'd think that by now we'd have put safeguards in place to protect us in case another crop blight emerges from the dark corners of Mother Nature's poisonous locker. After all, a large scale blight that we can't stop that could target corn, wheat or rice wouldn't kill a million like in 19th century Ireland it could kill in the magnitude of a hundred times more, potentially hundreds of millions. But here's a cold sobering reality for you. Today, the world is more reliant on monocultures than ever before in history. In the 1840s, Ireland was the only country that relied on the lump of potato. Today, we have a range of monocultures that the entire planet depends on. For example, more than 90% of the world's soy is grown in just four countries, America, Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. And if you think that's bad, consider this. 75% of the world's chocolate, well, cocoa, is grown in a single area, West Africa. All of which means that if a new strain of blight were to wipe out the world's soy or chocolate crops, it would make the Irish potato famine look like a blip. And there have already been scares when it comes to the world's most eaten fruit, bananas. Worldwide banana production is a monoculture. Pretty much all commercially grown bananas are of the Cavendish variety. But it's susceptible to Panama disease, and there have already been countless outbreaks in recent decades. 
And even in modern times, potato blights are still causing chaos. In 2007, a new strain of blight wiped out much of the potato crop in Britain and Ireland. And for a while, it looked like history might be about to repeat itself. Thankfully, the response was swift and the effects were limited, but there's no guarantee we'll be so lucky next time. The good news is this is a problem we can do something about. We can't control the weather, but we can change the way we farm by diversifying what we grow and what we buy. We can all reduce our reliance on monocultures by eating a more varied diet. And we can all try to buy more food that's grown locally, so if there is a problem with the global food trade, we won't be as heavily impacted. So let's learn our lesson from the blight of the Irish and not let the ghosts of famine past haunt us in famine future. Thanks for watching.